Let us pray for the preached word. Our Father and our God, would you send your spirit among us to open our ears and our hearts to receive the words that you are about to speak to us. You give strength and courage to our pastor to speak boldly. You would stand with him and keep his mind clear that he may proclaim the truth to us. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans. Book of Romans, the fifth chapter, will be our, our primary text today. As much of the world uh, gathers together today, in fact, uh, Gene and I both had the occasion to be out this week and noticed that there are signs everywhere among churches. It, it's good to see that, good to know that many churches will be fuller than normal today. There will be people who are in the church of Jesus Christ today, hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ that ordinarily would not be, and for which we, we give thanks. Uh, thousands of sermons uh, will be preached today to mark the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the single biggest event in all of created history. The day on which Christ was raised from the grave, according to the scriptures. Now, we join uh, GFBC Conroe with other Reformed churches around the world and, and declaring, as I said, in our, our call to worship. This is, this is our 15th Easter Sunday so far in 2023. And, and we claim we, we are prepared to have 52 of them total in 2023. And yet, there is a, a benefit, there is a value to recognizing and focusing on a particular doctrine. On, on this day, and to recognize because the resurrection is so significant, not only in history, but for us as God's people gathered here today. But here's something I've noticed, I've observed, and this is, I'll admit, anecdotal. I can't conclusively say this, is, this applies universally, but something I've observed, there are two holidays on which churches tend to be more full than usual, right? Christmas, and Easter. And, and as a general statement, what I've observed at Christmas is the incarnation and the looking forward to the atoning work of Christ tends to be universalized. Where it's, it's taught as if Christ came for everyone, universally, without exception. And then when we come to Easter, it's almost the opposite error. It's so individualized that we lose sight of what God intended from all of eternity to accomplish with the redemptive work of Christ was to call a people to himself. Now, when we think about the resurrection, it is not wrong at all for us to meditate upon the benefits that we as individual Christians receive from Christ as he applies the work of his redemption. That's a good thing. It's a necessary thing for us to do. Here's what I wanted to do today. Is we've been working through our, our series on the duties and requirements of membership, church membership. I want, to re, I want to take that lens and apply it to this doctrine of the resurrection. The title of today's sermon is The Shared Hope of Church Membership. I want to provoke us to think beyond the individual benefit of the resurrection of Christ. What is the benefit to us? Christopher Ash has a wonderful little book called The Priority of Preaching. And one of the things that I think he very helpfully, the issue he raises in that is when we think about application, we ought to discipline ourselves, train ourselves to ask this question, what does this mean to us before we ask, what does this mean to me? Or how does this apply to us before we ask, how does this apply to me? So with that in mind, I've chosen as our text today Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 5. And in here, we have some glorious things that, that, that the Apostle Paul, through the ministry of the Spirit, is presenting to us as the gathered church and provokes us to think about, and I'm going to back up and read uh, about midway through chapter 4 in a minute to get a, a running start, because Paul's dealing with the glorious doctrine of justification. 
and rooting that doctrine of justification in the finished work of Christ, including his resurrection. That's, that's really where the, 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 the gate hinges here. The gate swings upon the hinge of the resurrection. Without it, we have no hope. As Paul would declare to the church in Corinth, if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, then Paul's preaching is in vain. Our hope is in vain. Our faith is futile. We might as well eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die and there is no hope. But, Paul says, but Christ has been raised from the dead. So in him, we have this supreme hope. And what we find in Romans 5 is not an exhaustive list by any means, but it is a representative list of the benefits that we share together, saints. So I want to provoke you to think in those ways. Go home and meditate upon the benefits of the resurrection to you as an individual Christian. That will be wonderful. But let's first consider what are the benefits to us corporately? What are the benefits to us as God's gathered people? So let's turn our attention now to the hearing of God's Word. I'm going to begin in verse 13 of chapter 4, so we can get a, a running start. And I will ignore the chapter break that you and I both know was not originally there in chapter 5. And I'll read down through verse 5 of chapter 5. So here is the word of our Savior. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our our trespasses and raised for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I want to draw out three things from the text here in Romans chapter 5 with respect to the shared hope of church membership, the shared hope that we enjoy together as God's people. First of all, we share the hope of benefits received from Christ. We we receive benefits together in, in Christ. Secondly, we share the hope that our sufferings will bear fruit. We share the hope that our sufferings will bear fruit. And thirdly, we share in the love of God through His Spirit. We share in the love of God through His Spirit. Let's notice, first of all, what Paul says here. Here's this prominent therefore, the beginning of chapter 5. Paul has just said, the words it was counted to him, meaning Abraham, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. 
And Paul's not speaking only to the church at Rome. He's speaking to us. All these years later, gathered in Conroe, Texas. He's speaking to you. He's speaking to me. He's saying these words were written for us also. And it will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus Christ our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Notice that phrase, raised for our justification. See, Christ lived a perfect, sinless, spotless life, so much so that when he was crucified unjustly, when he was murdered unjustly, the grave could not keep him, not just because of God's kindness and benevolence before him, but because Christ deserved to be raised from the dead because he did not deserve to be in the grave to begin with. There was no sin in him. And on the basis of that perfection, and the fact that God did raise him from the dead because he was deserving of being raised from the dead. And then Paul says, our justification is grounded right there. On the basis of Christ's perfection, not yours, not mine, but Christ's. And Paul says, he was delivered up for our trespasses and he was raised for our justification. Isn't that a contrast? He, he's in the grave, he was nailed to the cross, he was dead and buried because of you. And because of me. But he was raised. He was raised because of his own merit. He was raised because of his own righteousness. And that righteousness now by the grace of God through faith has been applied to us if we were in Christ. And then Paul says, therefore, since it's true that on the account of his resurrection we have been justified and all of our sins pardoned and all of the righteousness of Christ credited to us, because that's true, since that's a fact, Here's what happens next. Here are the benefits that accrue to us corporately. Notice Paul's pronouns here are all plural. Since we have been justified by faith, here, is, here are the benefits that Christ says, that Paul says accrues to us on account of the justification that Christ has earned for you and for me. The imputed righteousness of our justification. He says, we have peace with God. I mean, look around you. We come from all different backgrounds, all different places, all, all kinds of different testimonies. Some of those testimonies would include things for which we are ashamed of in our past. And yet God has granted us peace. He's granted us peace together. And again, Paul's list here is not exhaustive. He's not saying this is everything that we gain from Christ. But these, these are representative of the benefits that Christ has purchased for us. We have peace with God. Here's what this implies. Before Christ came, before Christ's work in you, you were not at peace with God. Whether you knew it or not, whether you were consciously aware of it or not, you were born at enmity with God. You were, you were born at war with Him and He with you. And yet for love's sake, he sent his own son to atone for your sin, to cleanse you of all unrighteousness, and to grant to you the full measure of righteousness that Christ earned so that he could be at peace with you and you could be at peace with him. See, the wrath of God is stored up. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. And yet God in his grace has made peace with us. Paul goes on, he says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 2, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Because of the fact that we are born in sin, the fact that we are born at enmity with God means not only do we not have peace with God, but there's no hope of access to him. A couple of years ago, as we studied through the book of Esther, it, 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 was, it was prominent in, in, in several of the scenes there where Esther, of course, married to a pagan king, even as the wife of the king was not allowed to come into the presence of the king unless he held out the golden scepter and summoned her to come. And it was a threat of death for anyone who dared, even the wife of the king. For anyone to come into the presence of the king unsummoned, uninvited, unwelcomed. 
through the work of Christ and as a, as a consequence, as an application of the benefit of the redemption purchased through his resurrection, we have access to God. We can come before him at any time and at any place, and especially as we gather here together under the ordinances of God, publicly calling upon him, he's here present with us. We have access to him, and we have a, a certainty that the golden scepter has been extended to us, and we can come assured that he will receive us as children, receive us warmly, graciously. We have access to God by faith into this grace in which we stand. It's not just an access in which we stand there trembling, wondering what is God going to do to us. He's given us access. He's opened the door, but we don't know what's going to happen next. Surely you've had that experience multiple times in your life. A door is open for you, for a job, for a relationship, for a move, and you think, but I don't know what's going to happen. Is this going to be a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. We have the certainty that the door has been opened for us to be received graciously, kindly, warmly. Not only that, look at verse 3, or look at the second half of verse 2. This grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Saints, because of the resurrection, we have a certainty. When Paul uses the word hope, Paul's not, he's not using this in, in terms of some uh, limited expectation or some tentative desire for something that may or may not happen. When Paul uses the word hope, it, it's a settled reality. It's this hope in which we stand, and it's not some just vague concept, the hope of the glory of God. He's pointing us to fix our eyes upon the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, at which time not only will we see his resurrected and glorified body, but we will receive a body like unto his, a glorified body. And so what we gain in that is a joy, a rejoicing, a common joy that comes with a shared hope of one day being resurrected to new life just as Paul says, the seed goes into the ground and it dies. And God is pleased to raise up that corruptible, perishable seed into something that is imperishable and incorruptible. And as we look at the wickedness of the world around us, and as we are consciously aware of the wickedness that remains in us, isn't that a cause for rejoicing? That one day it will not be like this. One day that sin that ensnares you so easily today will have no cling to you, no hold upon you, not even a temptation to you when you are raised in newness of life. The fears, the anxieties, the struggles, the sorrows that cling to you now will only be a cause of greater rejoicing for eternity with Christ. Plus, these are things we share together. In the language of our, of our catechism, it breaks it down into, into three questions, but really three categories. And these are wonderful things to, to meditate upon. This is in our Baptist Catechism, questions 39, 40, and 41. The, the first question, 39, asks, what are the benefits which in this life, today, right now, what are the benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification? Th these are all benefits in this life of the resurrection of Christ being applied to us. The answer is the benefits which in, this, which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification are assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Spirit, increase of grace, and perseverance therein to the end. See, we're not only waiting for a benefit that will come one day, either when we die or when the Lord returns. But there are benefits in this life. And here's an interesting thing. I think, uh, I didn't have it in my notes, but I think there are five scriptural footnotes in that catechism question. Two of them come from the passage that we're studying today in Romans 5. The idea of, of the assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, are, are immediately rooted here in Romans 5 as a direct consequence 
of Christ having accomplished our justification through his sinless, perfect, spotless life, through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection, through his ascension into heaven, through his session, being seated at the right hand of God, and through the promise of his return. Well, that brings us to the next question. What benefits do believers receive from Christ at their death? What benefits do we receive at our death? The answer is the souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness. Isn't that cause for rejoicing? Even just that phrase. Imagine yourself perfect in holiness. This is a gift of Christ. And at death, we do immediately pass into glory. And our bodies, being still united to Christ, do rest in their graves until the resurrection. Well, then that ought to immediately bring to mind, then, okay, well, what are the benefits yet to come? There are benefits in this life, there are benefits at our death, and there are also benefits when? At the resurrection. That's the next question. What benefits do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection? The answer is at the resurrection, believers, being raised up in glory, shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment. And made perfectly blessed, both in soul and body, in the full enjoyment of God to all eternity. Saints, as we think about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, this this central feature in all of human history, may we meditate together upon the the, the shared hope, the shared benefits that we have uh, together as a consequence of this resurrection. But there's something else we see here in the text, beginning in verse 3. Not only do we have the, the, the hope of shared benefits in Christ, According to his, or as a consequence of his resurrection. But we share the hope that our sufferings in this life will actually bear fruit. See, sometimes we're tempted to think, even on our best of days, even when things are going well, we might have this nagging suspicion what's the point? What's really profitable here? But how much more are we tempted when trials come? When suffering comes, when difficulties confront us, when God's frowning providence comes our way, what is the hope there? We have a certainty, we have an assurance, we have a promise that that suffering, and especially when we suffer together, it's going to bear fruit. Notice what he says in verse 3, not only that. So here's, Paul's running through this list of, of benefits. Again, not an exhaustive list. But we have peace with God, we have access to God, we have joy together, we had a shared righteousness. But not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Now, either that's just crazy talk, or Paul understands something through the Spirit that we need to get a hold of. He says, not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance or patience or perseverance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Here's this wonderful chain of events that happen to us in the context of suffering, but only because Christ has been raised from the dead. If Christ had not been raised, suffering would be pointless and fruitless. But because he has been raised from the dead, we have the certainty, we have the assurance that we as God's people will share a fruitful suffering. But what does Paul mean by this? Now, his emphasis is particularly on suffering that occurs for Christ's sake and for the sake of the gospel. But let's work these things out. Paul says we rejoice in suffering knowing this, that because of the resurrection of Christ, Our suffering will produce endurance. It will produce patience. It will produce perseverance in us. And that that perseverance, that patience, that endurance will in turn produce in us godly character. Paul has already spoken to us about the righteousness that we receive from Christ. I mean, that's that's part of the definition of what it means to be justified is that not only our sins are cleansed, our slate is wiped clean, the certificate of debt that we owed was nailed to the cross and buried with Christ. That's half the gospel. The other half is that God, that Christ's perfect righteousness has been credited to us. And, 
And on account of that, we can say that our suffering now is producing endurance, which then produces character. We have, we have an alien righteousness. We have a righteousness that doesn't belong to us. It belongs to Christ. It's been given to us by faith. And yet, through the process of sanctification, God is creating actual righteousness in us. Theologians might refer to that as ethical righteousness. Well, we are growing in actual holiness. We're more and more, as a Christian, you obey the Word of God. You delight in His law in your inner being. You see the sins that which you once struggled mightily. You're now getting power over by the grace of God. And Paul says, one of the key ways that God accomplishes that in and among his people is through suffering. Matthew Henry explains it this way, tribulation work, worketh patience, not in and of itself, but the powerful grace of God working in and with the tribulation. It proves, and by proving, improves. And, and, and when he uses the word prove here, it means by, by testing, by refining. So it proves, and by proving, it improves. Patience, as parts, gifts increase by exercise. That which worketh patience is a matter of joy. For patience does us more good than tribulations can do us hurt. Tribulation in itself worketh impatience, but it is sanctified to the saints, and it worketh patience. See, you know this to be true. Just, just intuitively, you know that apart from the grace of God, suffering in you doesn't create patience and endurance, does it? Matthew Henry is exactly right. But by, by nature, it creates what? Impatience with us. It, it, it creates a faltering spirit. It, call, it creates a desire for us to say, you know what? I'm going to raise the white flag. I'm done. I quit. But by the power of the resurrected Christ working in you, God transforms what would be to your harm and makes it to your benefit. That which ordinarily would do you harm does you good. To, to restate his words, patience does us more good than tribulations do us hurt. We actually grow from this. And again, Think of this first as, as a shared hope in shared suffering. We share together in the body of Christ the, the certainty that our suffering for the sake of Christ will bear fruit among us. And specifically, it will bear the fruit of patience and endurance and perseverance. And, and also, by, by means of God's sanctifying work in us and, and among us, we have this hope of true holiness taking root. And, and Paul cannot be speaking only individualist, only individually here, or individualistically here. Because if we're honest, if our hope rests on seeing our own fruit, aren't we more likely to be discouraged at that point than we are encouraged? But as we see the gospel taking root in and among our brothers and sisters, as we see families growing, as we see children being raised to the glory of God, as we see marriages being restored and renewed, as we see God's people growing in their love for one another, aren't we encouraged by that? Aren't we encouraged to see brothers and sisters we know have been through a rough season? We know they have suffered hard, and yet we see their faith grow. We see godly character being produced there. Doesn't that encourage you? See, this is, the, this is the power of the resurrection at work within God's people. And it encourages us, it renews us, far more than just our own growth in character could accomplish. In Philippians, when Paul's writing there to the Philippian church in chapter 1, in verse 29, he says, For it's been granted for, to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. It seems to me 
maybe maybe it will to you as well. It seems to be an a strange choice of words by Paul. It's been granted to you. Now, what usually follows after such a phrase? It's been granted to you. Something good, right? So something you're looking forward to. Something you're eager to receive. Gather around, children. Dad has decided to grant you with something. Wonderful, Dad. What's the gift you're going to give? Suffering. Trial. Hardship. It's been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Commenting on this passage in in Philippians, William Hendrickson makes this helpful observation. He says, there are adversaries who cause believers to suffer. Now, suffering is not a privilege in itself. Amen. Right? All by itself, suffering is no privilege. No one signs up for it. No one should look for it. One should not, he says, no, one should not court suffering. In other words, you don't go looking for it. But suffering in behalf of Christ, in the interest of him and his gospel, is different. Such suffering is indeed a blessing, a gracious privilege, because it brings Christ nearer to the soul of the Christian. In his suffering for Christ's sake, the believer begins to understand the one who suffered redemptively for him and receives the sweetness of his enduring fellowship. It is only through the means of suffering that we begin to grasp in in some small measure the degree of suffering that Christ endured for us and to be encouraged by that, to find our hope there. See, do we see the fruit in the life of the Apostle Paul? I mean, later on, to the, in this, to the same Philippian church, he writes, I have learned to be content. In, in hunger or in plenty. Whether I've been clothed or naked, I've learned to be content. Now, the implication there is that there was a time when Paul didn't understand contentment. Even as a Christian man. And that through hardship, through suffering, God taught him, God instructed him, God discipled him, God sanctified him. And Paul could testify, I've learned this. Now Paul says, you're engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now here that I still have. And Paul says, and, and you see the fruit in me. He's not bragging. He's saying, you, you've seen what God has done in me. And do you know how he did it? It's one of our newer hymns that, that I, I love for us to sing. Isaac Watts asked this question, I asked the Lord that I might grow. Now that's a dangerous prayer, isn't it? And the hymn works that out eloquently. That God shows us our own secret hidden sins. He shows us the difficulties of this world. He shows us the difficulties all around us. And by that, he answers our prayers. See, we share the hope of benefits received from Christ. We also share the hope that our sufferings are going to bear fruit, saints. And particularly as we contemplate these sufferings corporately, as we bear one another's burdens, as we lift one another up in prayer, week by week by week in our our prayer meeting, as we hear how how our brothers and sisters are, what what they're struggling with, how they're challenged, particularly how, how they're suffering for the gospel's sake and how God has been faithful and sustaining them, and granting them the grace of endurance and perseverance, and then by that, creating in them a godly character. And we are all encouraged as we hear those things together. But then also we see, lastly, here in verse 5, this hope does not put us to shame because, Paul says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. We share in the love of God through His Spirit. And again, we we tend to think, first of all, individually. And it is true, it is a glorious fact that upon regeneration, the moment a a Christian is born again, or I should say the moment a sinner is born again and becomes a Christian, the Holy Spirit is poured into them. That is true. And we rejoice in that. And also, the Spirit of God is poured out among His people. Christ, the risen and exalted Christ, is present with us at this very moment in the person of his Holy Spirit. And it is evidence of the love of God 
that that Spirit has been poured out upon us. Paul speaks of peace with God the Father through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that's, that's an immediate consequence of God's eternal love. Notice how Paul speaks of the benefits of our redemption in explicitly Trinitarian language. I mean, here in, in verses 1 through 5, we have the Father, we have the Son, we have the Holy Spirit. Paul's not divided God. And, and he, he speaks of God's of our access to God the Father obtained through the turn, atoning work of Jesus the Son. He speaks of the love of God the Father poured into us through the Holy Spirit. In my estimation, it's one of the most beautiful phrases that we find in our confession of faith is, is in the, the chapter on the doctrine of God. And there are only three paragraphs. You would, we might think that would will, that will be the, one of the largest chapters in our confession. But paragraph three asserts God's existence as one God in three persons. And the very last phrase, the very last sentence is, is wonderful to think about and to meditate upon. In this divine infinite being, there are three subsistences, the Father, the Word, or Son, and Holy Spirit, of one substance, power, and eternity, each having the whole divine essence, yet the essence undivided. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, all infinite without beginning, therefore but one God, who is not to be divided in nature and being, but distinguished by several peculiar relative properties and personal relations. Now here's the phrase. Which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence upon Him? That's worth memorizing. This doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence upon Him. You know what? I think the Apostle Paul would give a hearty amen to that. All the apostles would. That's exactly what he's saying here. We, we've been justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and now we have access to God the Father. We have peace with God the Father. This hope does not put us to shame because God's love, God's eternal, unmerited, infinite unsurpassable love has been poured out upon us by the Holy Spirit. There could be no greater expression of the love of God than His triune commitment to making peace with men. From eternity. From eternity. It's, 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 this is mind-boggling. When did God's love for you begin? It's a trick question. It didn't begin. There was no time, if you are in Christ, there is no time when God did not love you. And that love has now been poured out in the person of His Spirit upon His people gathered together. Look ahead at, at Romans 5. I stopped at verse, at verse 5. Look at verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we save, be saved by Him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. How much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Do you follow Paul's reasoning? He says, you know, men have some semblance of love, and, and, and men might even be willing to die, even give of themselves for a righteous person or for a righteous cause. But Paul says, no one's going to give themselves up voluntarily for an unrighteous person. But such was the love of God that he sent his only begotten son to give up his life for men while they were still sinners. While you were dead in your trespasses, saints, 
while you were stubbornly refusing to submit yourself to God, while you were kicking and screaming against the law of God in your inner man, that's when Christ died for you. See, sometimes we get this backwards and we think, well, because Christ loved us and died for us and gave himself up for us, now God is somehow obligated to love us, not because he really wants to, but because Christ did all this and now God's on the hook. That's backwards. Christ died because the Father from eternity chose to set his love upon you, not because you deserved it, not because you merited it, not because you would ever earn it but out of his free and sovereign will and out of the overflow of his gracious character. What explanation does the apostle give for the work of redeeming us in Christ? Love. Love. And, and, and again, it's not a love of Christ imposed back upon the Father. This is a love of God the Father exhibited through the Son and now poured out upon his people through His Holy Spirit. God, Paul compares God's love to the very best love of sinful men and finds that there is no comparison, is there? I love the words of Isaac Watts, a wonderful hymn that we, we often sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. He says, See from His head, His hands, His feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Things we cannot comprehend, we cannot begin to comprehend the depth of God's love for you, for us gathered together. It is a white, hot, holy, pure, undefiled, infinite, incomprehensible love. We share, because of this love expressed in the resurrection of Christ, we have a, a, a shared hope in benefits received from our triune God because of the resurrection of Christ. We share a hope that our sufferings are going to bear fruit, that, that sufferings have a terminus, they have a point, they have an end game. And it's godly character in us. It's patience, it's endurance. We, we share in, in the love of God that's poured out upon us, lavished upon us through the person of His Spirit. Now let's think about what are the implications of these things? Because Paul says, since this is true, this is a given. If you are in Christ, this is true of you right now. You're not waiting for this to become true if you measure up. This is you're not waiting for you if you reach a certain degree of sanctification, some third or fourth level or something that you will... You, suddenly the benefits kick in. This is not like taking a new job and after your first year you get a week's of vacation or something like that. You're not waiting for a certain thing to kick in. It. If you are in Christ, you have been justified and these benefits are yours. They are ours. But what are the implications? What are the, the applications? We think about this, again, first from a, a corporate perspective. If we meditate upon the fact that we share the hope of benefits received from Christ, this has immediate implication upon our Christian relationships, doesn't it? I mean, as you think about our fellowship together as a local assembly, as you look around, and, 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 and as, you know, things are going to happen among us, we're going to stub each other's toes, we're, we're going to step on each other's toes, we're going to offend and hurt and wound one another, and as we look around in the midst of that kind of thing happening, we can look to our left and right and say, my brother shares my justification before Christ. My, my sister stands perfectly righteous before God just as I do. No less, no more than me. Isn't that an encouragement to us to think about that? Sometimes that's the neighbor in your home. It's the one in your own bed. 
And you look at that, that person who I'm not real happy with right now shares a righteousness in Christ with me. We stand together. We share a peace with God. Look around you. People from all different places, different backgrounds, we together share equally a peace with God. When Paul says in Romans 8, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, he's speaking to all of us who are in Christ equally. And that has immediate implications for how we relate to one another, how we view one another, how we discourse with one another, how we handle even disagreements with one another. We have access to God. In the midst of sorrow, in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of conflict, we have access to God together. In fact, in, in the Philippian church, when there's a threat of a, uh, of, of a either a, a disagreement is about to or already has broken out among the church between two godly ladies, Sintike and Yodia. Yodia and Sintike. Paul reminds the whole church at that point, the God of peace is with you. He's present. Why? Because we have access to God. We, we share a common joy in the expectation that together we will be resurrected. That together we will enjoy glorified bodies in full fellowship, unhindered in the ways that we are currently hindered in our fellowship. But not only that, to use Paul's language, not only that, we have the blessing of shared suffering. But I wonder if you can feel like I do how this cuts against the grain of our flesh. What's our tendency in suffering? We're going to suffer alone, don't we? Or, or are we going to suffer with some sort of superficial community? Blast it out on, on the internet or something, and that's, that's, you know. Well, I won't go there. But we tend to suffer either alone or with a false sense of community. But the hope that we have in Christ is we have a genuine sharing of suffering. And, and especially when that suffering is because of our commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do, do we think about the endurance, the patience, the perseverance gained, and the character established in us corporately? Do, do you look around you? I mean, sometimes we get so busy we don't look up. Do, we, do, or do you condition yourself? Do you train yourself to look up and rejoice at the holiness that you are seeing established in your brothers and sisters? When you're seeing this brother who used to stumble regularly, now you see him standing upright. You see a sister who, who, who used to, to struggle with these things and now, by the grace of God, is walking in a more sure-footed way. Do you rejoice in that? This, this also should, should have a, a profound effect on the way we pray. I was struck this week, and, and I, I sent out an email to you about a, a dear family with one of our sister churches who, who got grievous news regarding twins that are in their womb. And, and of course, we, we pray for that family. Do you know what I failed to put in that, in that request? You pray for that church. It's the entire church body that's ministering to that family who will share in their rejoicing at the godly character that's being produced in them as God increases their hope and more firmly establishes them the entire Christian community will rejoice in that will gain endurance with them will gain perseverance with them will increase their hope with them I think about Covenant Presbyterian Church in Nashville, Tennessee. Having their, little, their school violently assaulted by a lunatic. And to gather the next Lord's Day, singing praise to their king in the midst of grievous suffering. Unimaginable suffering. To have six among them, including three children, murdered. 
And so this, this understanding of the shared suffering and the promised fruit of that suffering because of Christ's resurrection ought to affect how we pray, shouldn't it? We pray not only for an individual who suffers, but ought we to pray for the whole community of faith? That the Lord would do a work of grace within all of them? Not only that, we share together in the love of God poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. I mean, we, we cannot fathom. We can never plumb the depths of God's holy, infinite, pure, unmerited love for us. I had a quote sent to me by a friend this week. This 19th century English pastor by the name of Octavius Winslow. That's not my friend. My friend sent me his quote. To me, this quote. Listen to this. Little did they dream as they bound the fatal wood upon his shoulder by whose power that tree was made to grow and from whom the beings who bore him to death drew their existence. So completely was Jesus bent upon saving sinners by the sacrifice of himself, he created the tree upon which he was to die. and nurtured from infancy the men who were to nail him to that accursed tree. Oh, the depth of Jesus' love to sinners. And that quote was sent to me by a dear friend who lost his wife less than two years ago and who rejoices today in the promise of the resurrection. A shared suffering a suffering that is diminished within a community, but the blessings of which are magnified in that same community. As we meditate upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ, may the Lord give us grace not to think of the benefits of the resurrection to ourselves only. That's wonderful to think about, but don't stop there. In fact, I'd urge you not even to start there. But to think in terms of what has God accomplished for his people, for us corporately, as a consequence of Christ's resurrection. May the Lord give us grace to think in these ways. May we consider the grace of the Lord poured out upon us as his whole body. We close with Paul's exhortation to the Corinthian church. In chapter 15, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ. Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The saints, it's there that we place our hope. It's there that we place our trust. Not only that he has been raised, but all of those benefits that he has purchased for us accrue to us because of that resurrection. And we look forward to a sure hope of our own resurrection in him. If you're outside of Christ, if you've not believed upon this crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected Lord, I plead with you today. Make today the day of your salvation. Do not wait. Do not think tomorrow will do. There, there, today is the day of salvation, declares the Lord. Fall upon the mercy of Christ. Run to him. Run to his cross. Confess your sin before him and trust that he is both able and he is willing to join you with the great company of all those who he has redeemed and to preserve you until the day of his return. Amen. Let's pray. Father and our God, we 
rejoice in all that you have done. Father, will you grant to us by your Spirit's power the grace to, to, to understand, to believe these things. To be firmly established in the truth that Christ came to die for sinners. Will you grant us the grace to persevere in believing that in him our sins are washed away, that in him we have been justified, adopted, and sanctified, and that by your Spirit's power, by the promise of Christ's blood, we are being preserved until the final glorious day of our triumphant resurrection. Guard us and keep us. Cause us, according to your word, to love one another, to rejoice in our shared suffering, and to delight in the benefits that you've given to us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.